Now, Law uh, Sheriff, you just stated out of your own words that there was a disturbance in the parking lot. Since you're trying to put on uh, several hats and pretend as though you're a lawyer, let's talk about that a little bit. Disturbance. Legal definition. First of all, if there is a disturbance, who started the disturbance? That's just a conversation between me and you. Now, we have this woman who had just gotten off work from her job as a nurse, a trained professional, quietly minding her own business, sitting in her car, waiting for her boyfriend to return to the car with her five-year-old son and a candy bar that the little boy wanted or whatever else they were going to buy. She's certainly not causing a disturbance to anyone. But this white guy who you are defending walked up to her, decided that he would be the parking space police, and got in her face. Witnesses say that there was yelling on his behalf. It doesn't matter if she was yelling back, because the issue is starting a disturbance, not how we respond to a disturbance that he started. It was yelling on his behalf. There was name calling, including the use of the N-word. I'll go ahead and say it. He was calling her nigger. That's according to the witnesses. And another witness who you want to disregard, who encountered the same psychopath just about a few weeks earlier, he also called him a nigger and he threatened his life. He threatened to kill him for parking in a handicapped parking space. The man is clearly a lunatic and yet you are defending him. Here's what the law says. Disturbance. Being in a public place or on private property of another without consent and purposely causes inconvenience to another person or persons by unreasonably and physically obstructing vehicular or pedestrian traffic, etc. That's one. Now, that's the disturbance. What constitutes a disturbance of the peace? What does it say? Disturbing the peace is a crime. You said parking in the... You made a point to point out that uh, her parking in a handicapped parking space without a parking permit is a crime. The law says that disturbing the peace is a crime, but of course you don't care about that because that's what the white guy did. Generally defined as, listen carefully, the unsettling of proper order in a public space through one's actions. This can include creating loud noise by fighting or challenging to fight, disturbing others by loud and unreasonable noise, including loud music or profanity getting in your face, Calling them nigger and other things, it certainly constitutes disturbing the peace. And she is allowed to respond. She doesn't have to sit there passively and take it. She did not, she was not the provocateur of this disturbance of the peace. What is defined as a public disturbance? We have disturbance of the peace. Let's look here. It says, what is defined as a public disturbance? It is unlawful for any person to cause or for any person in possession of property to allow to originate from the property sound that is a public disturbance noise. Public disturbance noise means any noise, sound, or signal which unreasonably disturbs the comfort, peace, or repose of another person or persons. So generally, that's talking about playing loud music or yelling or cursing someone out who's minding their own business. What is considered disturbing the peace? Disturbing the peace, also known as a breach of the peace, is a criminal offense that occurs when a person engages in some form of disorderly conduct, such as fighting or causing excessively loud noise. Well, sir, the, loud, the noise was so excessively loud that um, concerned patrons ran into the convenience store and told the manager you should call the police. They were not saying you should call the police because maybe you should negotiate or have a uh, service mediator, but because there is a disturbance of the peace. So the question becomes who was the provocateur in this incident of disturbance of the peace? Who committed the crime of creating a public disturbance? And it was, of course, the white man, the same one who's also a murderer that you want to allow to get away with murder. 
Okay. Now, let's talk about the other crime he committed. Since you want to pretend like the little white man was innocent and he was assaulted by the big bad black man who pushed him. That's all he did is he pushed him. You can try to create a new narrative or frame it any way you want to, say that he was slammed to the ground, which is utterly ridiculous. I mean, you frankly look like a fool saying that. Unless you're talking to people that are intellectually defunct and incredibly, unforgivably, inexcusably stupid, people can see right through what you are doing in your little facade. Slammed to the ground. No, he was pushed. He was pushed. He was pushed or he was shoved. That's the only appropriate narrative there is. He was pushed or he was shoved. He kept saying he was slammed to the ground as though he was body slammed. Anyway, is it an assault to yell in someone's face? Which is what he was doing, even though she was in her car. Here's what the law says. Assault does not necessarily involve a physical attack. And you should know that. Assault is any action that causes the other person to fear bodily harm. Now, keep in mind, you and I both know that the only reason that her boyfriend intervened is because he feared bodily harm of his girlfriend. He did what he was supposed to do to protect her. And all he did is he removed the object of the fear by separating him, by pushing him far away enough where he could not commit imminent Injury to her. It was proactive self-defense. Because he was close enough to escalate from his obvious verbal, verbal vitriol to a physical attack. Which can happen in less than a quarter of a second. And it's impossible for you to stop it at that point if you're not there. He neutralized the physical threat by pushing him away. That's it. Now, assault is any action that causes the other person to fear bodily harm. It can be a slap, a punch, or a shove. But it can also be a verbal threat of violence, aggressive posturing, which includes a raised fist, jabbing a finger, or yelling angrily in someone's face. Now, Mr. Sheriff. Was the white man committing aggressive posturing? And I'm saying white man because I don't want to keep saying his name. Because he's, he's dirt. He's garbage. Was he doing that aggressive posturing? A raised fist, jabbing a finger? It says or, but he was doing all of it. It doesn't say and or. Aggressive posturing, raising a fist, jabbing a finger. It says either one of these, but he did all of them. Aggressive posturing, raising a fist, jabbing a finger, and yelling angrily in someone's face. That is an assault. It does not necessarily involve a physical attack. It is any action that can cause the person to fear bodily harm. And in this case, it caused her boyfriend to fear the fact that she could be injured and that bodily harm could be done to her. Would, it be would he have been correct if he, because of his fear based upon his perception and the Florida Stand Your Ground Law, does it allow him to use force in this incident? Absolutely it does, but of course you don't want to talk about it and most of the people coming on, commenting on this are ignoring it and I am encouraging you, do not ignore it. This is the basis for why this, this sheriff is wrong. And if there's going to be a legal argument at any point, this has to be the basis for it. Stand Your Ground Law gives the, the man the right to do exactly what he did when he pushed the man away. Now, if he'd have punched him, based on his perception, that would have been excessive. If he'd have pulled out a knife and stabbed him, it would have been excessive. If he'd have pulled out a gun and shot him, it would have been excessive. Because at that point, there was no physical altercation. But there was an assault. And under Florida law, based on his perception, the same argument the sheriff is trying to use for the murderer, the killer... See, you people, when you discuss this, you need to keep that in mind. Stand your ground law does not just apply to the man carrying a gun. It applies to the man who is protecting his loved one or anybody else. And it applies to the man who's capable of being a real man and able to defend somebody without always having to resort to a gun. Stand your ground law, the very same law this sheriff is citing, applies to the man and exonerates him from putting his hands on the other man who was in his woman's face doing what under the law is described as an assault. Let's read it again.
particularly for the stupid people. Assault does not necessarily involve a physical attack. Assault is any action that causes the other person to fear bodily harm. Or if I fear that you may harm somebody else, whether it is a child, even if it's your child, whether it's a woman, even if it's your wife, whether it is anyone else that I think that I fear that bodily harm is imminent, I am allowed. I am allowed to intervene. I just cannot exceed that which is reasonable and necessary to protect the other person. And a push is certainly not excessive. The sheriff, obviously, who has made up his mind, he probably made up his mind based upon his body language, his posturing, and everything else. If you know how to read body language, um, obviously, this man is not going to tell you where he is or where he stands when it comes to race relations, but I wouldn't be surprised if he's a car carrier member of the KKK himself. He's already taken sides. I've never in my life seen a sheriff, and many people have commented on this, going out of their way, posturing the way that he did to defend a killer as though he's an attorney and doing a very poor job, pretending like he actually understands the law. And maybe he does understand it, but he's pretending like he doesn't understand it because he's trying to appeal to the stupidity of people <coughs> who are going to be dumb enough and intellectually defunct enough to buy into his ignorance and his argument. Assault is any action that causes the other person to fear bodily harm. So even if the other person does not fear bodily harm, pay attention to this. If I fear that you may commit bodily harm against that person, I don't give a damn if it's your own child, your wife, girlfriend, it doesn't matter. I am allowed to react to the assault that I witness based upon my perception. And it can be a slap, a punch, or a shove, but it can also be verbal threat of violence. You could say, well, is there evidence that he verbally threatened her? It doesn't matter. The law also says it can be verbal threat of violence, aggressive posturing, a raised fist, jabbing a finger, or yelling angrily in someone's face. And obviously all of this occurred because the bystanders, if you look at their body language and their, their, their testimony, they were very much concerned. They were witnessing an assault. It was it, 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 it was so clear in their mind that it was an assault that they wanted the store manager to call the police. Because the reason the law is written like this is because it can escalate. And very likely will escalate. And of course it did escalate. But the question becomes, who was the provocateur? See, we can look at the Stand Your Ground statute in Florida. Let's see what the law says here. Verbal assault usually involves threatening physical violence on someone, although sometimes yelling or aggressively using words to offend or attack someone can constitute verbal assault. Let me read that again for the slow people. Verbal assault usually involves threatening physical violence on someone. In other words, if I say, I'm going to kick your ass, I'm going to shoot you, I'm going to stab you, that's a verbal assault. Now, although sometimes, and certainly in this case, because look at the response of all the witnesses. Many of them got far away as quickly as they could because they would they felt that something could happen very quickly some of them ran into the store and there's a white guy who was stepping over towards them in order to possibly intervene or at least try to uh, mediate the situation so certainly there was a verbal assault taking place and it's obvious who instigated it now sometimes yelling or aggressively using words to offend or attack someone can constitute verbal assault you think that's not a verbal assault if I'm setting my car minding my own business? It doesn't matter what the reason is. It doesn't matter if I'm parked over two lines. It doesn't matter if I haven't registered my car. Or, or, or maybe it doesn't matter what the situation is. Maybe my tail light is broken. You think that's dangerous. And you, you, you are entitled under the first minute to say something to him about it. But if it escalates to the point, if you escalate to the point of yelling aggressively, using words to offend or attack me, calling me nigger and all of that, then you are committing a verbal assault. The law says the threats must be something the assailant is capable of carrying out and which can cause fear of imminent danger to the victim. Again, the threats don't have to be by words. Sometimes yelling or aggressively using words to offend or attack someone can constitute verbal assault, and it certainly would in this case. New messages received from we already know that the white man was guilty of disturbing the peace. We know that he was the provo provocateur. Is there a law against verbal assault? Is 
If you punch someone that is harassing you verbally, is it considered self-defense? Is it legal? Now, this is a response. I don't even know what it says yet. I'm just going to read it. Stephen had an LLB degree, 25 years in litigation, administrative law, collections, bankruptcy, and professional regulation. As a rule, there is no amount of verbal harassment that justifies or excuses assault unless the person uses actual fighting words and not just, I should get up, walk up to you, and kick your ass. You are not acting in self-defense. In order to establish a defense of self-defense, you have to prove that. Now, read this carefully. You believe, even subjectively, that you, and I'm going to insert, or someone else, was in danger of physical injury at the hands of the assailant. So if her boyfriend believed, even subjectively, that simply means it is subject to his belief, not yours. Doesn't matter if you would have believed it. The law says if he believed that she was in danger of physical injury at the hands of the assailant, and there are two conditions, you, and this is extraordinarily important, and you use force proportional to the danger of injury to yourself, and I'm going to insert, or someone else. For example, you cannot shoot someone who is threatening you or someone else with their fists, but you can certainly hold them off with your hands and fists. <laughs> That's what the law says. You cannot shoot someone who is threatening you with their fists. And we're going to look specifically at Florida Statute 760 as well. You can't shoot someone who is threatening you with their fists, but you can certainly hold them off with your hands and fists. The force must be proportional to the danger of injury to yourself. And in this case, the force was absolutely proportional. He didn't even punch the guy. He didn't stab the guy. He didn't even threaten to do anything. He simply did what was clearly a self-defense move. He pushed the guy out of range of his girlfriend. So if the guy had any thoughts or inclinations to at any moment slap, punch, strike, stab, or shoot her because of the vitriol that he was expressing and spewing out of his mouth, based upon his perception, she was in imminent danger. And the amount of force he used was proportional. He pushed the guy away from her. Basically saying, if you want to fight somebody, it's going to have to be me. I'm not going to let you do what I perceive you may do any moment now, which is punch her and strike her. His perception is all that matters. You cannot apply this standard to the murderer and not apply it to the murdering, the murder victim. It has to work both ways.